This is a reading from the book of Azariah by Marie Valtorta. Passion Sunday, April 7th, 1946. He awakens me from a peaceful sleep in which I was dreaming. I was in a meadow with short, tender, emerald grass, limited by a wall which was already high, but regarding which I myself, I don't know for what reason, was saying it should be raised higher, and specifying for defense, and the wall, in fact, rose up to a height of at least five meters, really insurmountable, as it was so smooth and lofty. I saw only this large meadow, untrod by human feet, and this extremely high wall, and above, a sky packed with little stars, which the advancing dawn rendered ever smaller and paler. And the one awakening me is my Lord, who calls me and touches my head. I open my eyes and say, Here I am, Lord. I was sleeping, and I feel a bit confused on realizing that I have imitated Peter, James, and John, who slept a while too often during their master's most solemn hours on Tabor and in Gethsemane. But Jesus smiles and says, And I was awakening you, my sweet victim, consuming yourself out of love for me. I have come to tell you that I am there wherever creatures suffer their passion, and I speak to them through the mouths of all the heavenly spirits, by the figures of the whole liturgy, and by my love, in addition ever stronger and more present, for I know what the passion is in its antecedents and in its ends, and I have infinite compassion for whoever suffers it out of love for me and for souls. I have experienced all your anguish, souls that are victims of the world and of love. Day by day, the more I disclose to you my three-year passion as a misunderstood master, as a mocked voice, and as a persecuted savior, you discover yourself in your measure as a creature, and like you are all those I have chosen for extraordinary service. But as I set my gaze on the goal, on the luminous, serene, glorious goal of my long and multiple suffering, and would say, I must go through this, which is painful, to reach that, which is glorious, so you, to be able to proceed among the cruel brambles on your way, full of snakes, thorns, and snares, and proceed with your burden on your shoulders to reach your destination, the immolation which is also the attainment of your goal, that is, co-redemption. You must always keep your eyes fixed on this goal, on perfect charity for souls, which is accomplished through complete self-sacrifice. There is no greater love than that of one who gives his life for his brothers and friends. I said so, and I did so. Maria, my dear, beloved Maria, my violet, who consume yourself for me, your love, and for your brothers and sisters, and who receive real reciprocation of love only from me, my consumed one, come, proceed, let us go together. The world and Satan may hate you, but only as far as the limit which I have set, lofty, insurmountable, like the wall seen by you in the dream. They are on that side, in their noisy, chaotic world, sullied with all the concupiscences, sown with all the most poisonous heresies. You are on this side, in the desert of this meadow, which has nothing but serenity and simple poverty and flowers with grass free of corruptions. You and I have made this meadow, together, I with my words, you with your acts of obedience. Do you see how big it is, what peace issues forth, and above all the serenity of the sky and the numberless stars that gaze at you and await you? They are your friends in heaven, my beloved bride. My light makes them seem smaller and dimmer, but when I leave you, they take my place with their celestial light and comfort you. Proceed alone, but never alone, until the end, and then, in a ray of starlight from your morning star, you will be absorbed, soul consecrated by pain, Maria, consumed for your God and for souls, and let this be what is to be written on your burial niche. Niche, O little martyr, this and nothing more concerning all that will remind men of you. You will be absorbed into the place of eternal peace, and from there you will radiate light upon men. Light of love and light of truth will be the pages which you have obediently written to fix my words on paper, and good men will remember you as a light, good men. In this too, similar to me, for my infinite light was loved and received only by a few in my time. The others, darkness, did not want to receive me and remained darkness. I bless you with all my dearest love for your comfort, for your comfort, for your comfort. I am left moved and blissful and I, st I stay that way until my Azariah begins his explanation. Azariah says, Come to our holy mass of the voices, to your holy mass of, these, of those undergoing their passion. Speak and pray with Christ, and like Christ, turn to the Father with the words of the Son, 
which the Holy Spirit grants that I may explain. Be my judge, O God. Only the upright in heart can say this, in the intimacy of their consciences, for it is easy to deceive men while invoking God as a witness, and we angels do not understand how they can do so without trembling with fear. That is, we understand it only by measuring how much Satan has made man decline. He is a creature of God, and Satan makes him satanic to the point of giving him strength to dare to invoke God without fear over his wicked actions. If it is easy to deceive men with this invocation, which is sacrilegious in certain mouths, it is not easy, it is not possible to do so when the conversation is intimate, having only one's guardian angel as a witness. Oh, the blameworthy and impenitent man dares not invoke God when he does not draw comfort from the proximity of his fellows. Even the, most, even the one most given to crime, lying, and sacrilege, even the one who, if the Most Holy Lord Jesus were to come back to the earth, would be capable of nailing him to the cross once again, for Satan would present Christ to him as a mere man, and present killing as a, a man as a trifle, even he, when he is alone with himself, before his own conscience, and the infinite mystery of God, dares not state impudently, Be my judge, O God. The guilty from Adam and Eve on, are capable only of fleeing or trying to flee from the sight of God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 and Genesis chapter 4 verse 16. Even he who denies that there is a God, if by a sudden reflection he has a flash of admission that God may also exist, does nothing but flee, to forget this existence. And the murderer, the thief, the corrupter, and all the guilty do so. And they do so all the more the greater their guilt is, the more often it is repeated. On the contrary, they arrive at new sins so as to suffocate awareness with the pseudo-certainty that God does not exist because he lets them act. Being able to kill, torture, steal, and usurp for them is proof that they are supermen, the gods, and no one is above them. In this motive of wanting to tell themselves that they are gods, that God does not exist and does not exist in conformity with life, judgment and punishment, that each is free to do what he feels is useful at any cost, by any means, lies the explanation for the repeated and ever more serious sins of the great sinners. But they are unable to place themselves alone before the alone, and they flee. Blameworthy before the judge, they are unable to stab and stand up and cry out, Be my judge, O God! Although they deny him and deride him, they have the instinctive fear of him which a wild beast has of man when the latter bravely goes forward to meet it, with prompt boldness and defense, the beast's instinctive raging fear of their tamer, of whose punishment they are afraid, and whose power they sense. They try to destroy the idea of God with a cunning swipe of their claw, but while sidestepping it, too lofty, that idea, too powerful, that God, it reduces them to ashes, it crushes them like pygmies upon whom a block of marble falls, like worms under the giant's foot and they flee. But the honest can, the honest can cry out, Be my judge, O God. Honesty has many faces. It is not just material honesty concerning the materials which have a name, coins, weights, and measures, with respect to fruits, harvests, and the goods of others. It is not just moral honesty regarding moral aspects which have a name, people's good names, sincerity, friendship, respect for women, and the position of others, but it is also spiritual honesty that is, truth in appearing what one really is, spiritually, not an, not an atom more. In your case, in the case of all of you, O oh extraordinary instruments, it is precisely and principally this. Spiritually dishonest, too, are those who are Catholic Christians only in appearance, but who, if it were possible to go back twenty centuries in time, would be perfect examples of Pharisees, that is, only apparently respectful of God and His law, and, and of that of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, but who in reality, after leaving front stage and returning with their, within their homes, their businesses or offices or occupations, are real anti-Christians, trampling upon all the articles and presets of Christianity, beginning with that of the love for God, their relatives, their employees, and their neighbors, and they will be judged as dishonest ones and repaid according to their deceitful acts by the judge who is merciful towards involuntary faults but inexorable towards calculated, impenitent acts of hypocrisy. But you, voices, extraordinary instruments, have to exercise certain acts of special honesty, that of not adding anything to the treasure, that of not squandering the treasure, that of acknowledging that it is not your work, 
but the work of God. Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 to 32, and Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 54 are the references stated in the gloss. To remain always kneeling with your arms outstretched, to receive, to support the weight which is given to you, and which you must hold upraised in a continuous offertory to the Most High, from whom it comes. Remember, what you receive should be offered to him who gives it to you, just as in the old law the sacrifices of what God had given were offered, lambs, rams, honeycombs, oil, sheaves of ears, all things which existed because he had created them, just as in the new law sacrifices are offered. But with what? With the body and blood of the one whom the Father has given you, the most holy lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He should be offered with the honors appropriate for something holy, that is, with pure hands, with spotless garment, on a precious cloth, on a precious pattern. What are they? Your irreproachable life, your spirit, which day by day must become precious with virtue, on your heart, immolated with the immolated one. O oh, blessed ones, do not weep in your suffering. Do not weep, Maria, Belo beloved to the Lord in your suffering. This is what makes you dear, your suffering. Listen, what has had value in the eyes of God? Your birth? Your culture? Social position? None of this. What were you as long as you were just Maria of Giuseppe and Iside, educated as befitted the daughter of a well-to-do family? You were a common soul, as there are millions of them among practicing Catholics. On your altar there was only one ornament. Do you know what it was? Your love for Jesus in his passion. The rest was neither more or less than what, would, what the great mass of Catholics had, what was strictly necessary in order not to be great sinners. Then sorrow took took you to the love of sorrow. Thanks to your relative love and God's infinite love for you, you have understood what the sorrow of God is and how he is consoled, and you have become a host, and God has accepted you as a host. Suffering. Your glory. Beloved soul of mine, did you perhaps think that only the flesh was destined to be consumed? Did you push the possibilities of suffering to the moral sphere at most? No, Maria. When a fire envelops a house, it burns from the cellar to the rooftop, don't you think? The fire of heaven has descended upon you, not to punish you, but to absorb you into, its, into himself, and it has taken all of you, and everything has turned into pain. Your chrism, see, even this beatific joy which is to hear, out, hear our most holy Lord speak is, is pain. The superficial will say, a woman who is made joyfully, a woman who is made joyful by union with God cannot undergo pain. And did the, divine, did the divine incarnate word not experience constant pain when he was Jesus of Nazareth? And yet, except for the hour of extreme severity and complete immolation, he was united to the Father and the Spirit. Footnote, the hour of extreme severity in which Jesus as a man experienced abandonment by God. And did she who was full of grace, the blameless one, not have pain as her companion in her life as an orphan, a wife, a mother, and a queen of the apostles? And yet, she did not deserve pain, as she was without fault, and she was united to God to the point of having, having him as her spouse and son, as well as father. Beloved soul of mine, do not weep. Rejoice at the fact that everything in you bears the chrism of pain, so that it will conform you to the most holy Jesus and Mary, and trust in the Lord. You can call him and say, Be my judge, O God. How sweet it must be for you, O creatures of the earth, to be able to say, Be my judge, to God your Father. These words are truly trustfully filial, this taking refuge in your God, whom you do not fear because a good conscience assures you that you have not offended him, and that you are placing yourself under his powerful protection, which takes up your defense against the profane and frees you from the iniquitous, deceitful man. For God is your strength. How much humility, love, security, and peace there is in this filial recourse, which bears witness that you know you are a nothing, conscious of being loved and justified by the all. Why, of course, don't cry. He, he, your most holy God, will radiate his light and his truth, not only upon you. He does this so, that, so much that he speaks to you as a dearest disciple, but also upon the truth of your mission. You heard him in the early hours of the day in his luminous promise. Good men will remember you as a light. If they remember you as a light, it is a sign that you are in the light. Those who are not good will not believe. Well then, it will serve to make you more like the Word, whom the darkness did not want to recognize. But why be concerned? 
Remember those words of Jesus. By their disbelief, they accumulate the stones with which they will be lapidated. Proceed on your way. Go straight to the mountain of God, to the eternal tabernacles of which the psalm speaks in the introit. Let us pray. We ask you, o Almighty God, to look upon your family, that it may be governed in body and preserved in soul by your grace, through the merits of your blessed word, who became flesh and died for men. Your family, all the faithful, are the family of God, but in every family there are the favorites, those closest to the head of the family, and that of the faithful you are the favorites, victim souls called to an extraordinary destiny. God will not disappoint the prayer, and as a father he will preserve you, for, as Paul says, you are the chosen portion which Jesus has redeemed by his sacrifice. Let us read Paul and meditate upon him. How did the most holy Lord Jesus Christ, having come as the pontiff of the future goods, enter once and for all into the sanctuary? The great majority of the ancient Israelites, and what is double blame doubly blameworthy is precisely in the cultivated majority, did not understand that Christ was the eternal pontiff, and what his kingdom and eternal pontificate would consist of, and they hated him out of the ungrounded fear, proceeding from an unnatural faith, degraded into materiality, they, they, that they would be despoiled of their prerogatives of power. But Jesus Christ did not have human aims. He did not reach out to the tiara and the crown. He reached out to gather together the children of his Father, disheartened, impoverished, debased, sick, wounded, and dispersed, and to heal, instruct, guide, and reconsecrate them in their dignity as children of the Father. Accordingly, to obtain this, he did not use the common means and places, but by passing through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by the hand of man, that is, making use of his most divine nature and eternal, perfect power to redeem the sin, otherwise not redeemable. He reduced himself to man, forcing the Holy of Holies, which he was, into the mortal tent of the flesh, to immolate himself instead of the goats and calves, and by his blood, shed for the redemption of men, be able to enter into the eternal sanctuary once and for all at the head of the redeemed. This is the means and the way by which you have been redeemed by him, whose super-sacred epic concluding in the final cry on Golgotha, the church narrates in these days. Matthew chapter 27 verse 50 and Mark chapter 15 verse 37. It is this with which he has prepared your conscience for the purity that is necessary to receive his words and your spirit for the works of life which he judges to be good for men. Without his blood, without his immolation fulfilled through the Holy Spirit, that is, through love, neither on earth nor in heaven would you have been able to serve the living God. Because of what you cost him, do not be afraid of his love. On account of the power of this love of his which spurred him to die to make you worthy to listen to him and understand him, harbor no doubts about his mercy. He, the eternal pontiff, can well introduce those whom he chooses into the sanctuary. The, the new covenant is this, not the will of men, money, conspiracies, or friendships among social castes hating each other but backing each other to do harm to those who are alone and, and usurping by embezzling the place of those designated by God, but God himself chooses his instruments, and these who are called receive the eternal inheritance through the promise of Jesus Christ and through his immolation. Come on, do not weep, host soul, or rather weep with Christ, who took on even the weakness and bitterness unknown in heaven of weeping in human nature. Luke chapter 19 verse 41 and John chapter 11 verses 33 to 35. You have seen him shed tears and blood, and the first blood-red mask was placed upon his blessed face by pain. The crown of thorns and the spray of scourging served only to maintain that mask upon the visage which men no longer deserve to see in the perfection of its pacific beauty. Conform, conform to your master, the master of doctrine and the master of immolation. He, too, crushed against the stone of Gethsemane under the press of all the world's pain, of all the severity of heaven, shed his final tears as a human creature. His flesh then moaned its last cry against the imminent agony. Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Mark chapter 14, verse 36, and Luke chapter 22, verses 41 to 42. For those who are unable to believe that Jesus was truly man and had man's affection for life and loathing towards death, this cry is a response which says, he was truly flesh. 
but may my will not be done, but rather yours. For those who are unable to believe that Jesus was truly God and had, God and had God's perfections, this cry is a response which says, He was truly God. For those who are unable to believe that you can be the spokeswoman, you're living, you're suffering, and you're dying after having drunk all bitterness while saying, Thy will be done, is the response which says that you are the spokeswoman, the one God has taken for an inscrutable mystery, which only in heaven will be known, to make you an instrument for a work of great mercy. Weep with him, with your master, in pain. Free me from the furious peoples, and profess, you alone can exalt and save me above my adversaries, and the iniquitous who do not know you, and hate me on account of your name, which signs in my actions. Weep with him over your long dereliction. Many have tormented me since my youth. Yes, you have come to him through many struggles and torments, and have been a martyr because of your faithfulness to his call, but they have not been able to overcome you, for above every other voice you were following that of your Jesus. Now that you are at his feet and are the instrument, it is natural that the enemies of the truth should erect an edifice of calumny upon your shoulders to crush you beneath it. The other Christs, though, have in common the passion and the crucifixion, but also the resurrection. And if men shut the voices of God in tombs, believing they are burying it forever, the forces of nature, obedient to God, shake off the useless enclosures, and the stones, the very stones, proclaim God the victor in himself and in his servants, opening out, allowing perfumes and light to emerge from their closed bowels, where the just man does not decompose, but rests to rise up higher, stronger, and more beautiful. In the meantime, while waiting for this hour, strong in the sincerity of your works with your master, respond to those who want to accuse or frighten you with doubts. Who among you can convict me of sin? And to anyone wishing to exalt you, and thus bring you about your ruin through pride, like the first ones by way of discouragement, respond, I do not seek my glory. There is one who looks after it, my Father. The glory which I would give myself, or which you give me, is nothing, but that which God will give me with his eternal peace, because of the honor I have given him, does exist. And be at peace. You will have life through his word, through his sacrament of love, through his sacrifice on the cross, and through yours as a victim. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. All my afflictions come from daily observation of how the words which God has said to me are in the hands of everyone, propagated, altered, and used without any approval whatsoever. How much, how much pain which comes to me from this disobeying of such frank orders by Jesus. Only God measures the breadth and depth of the torment which the acts of disobedience by others occasion me. But it is the time of the Passion.